Hello, here we are, another part, part three of Terry Pratchett's A Hatful of Sky, second book of the Tiffany Aiken series. So last night we um we were still on chapter one. It's quite a long old chapter, chapter one, but we were just getting those reintroductions, weren't we? So I'll carry on from where I left off in part two. Here we go. Nakmak Fiegel girls were very rare, and they grew up knowing that they were going to be Kelders one day, and Tiffany had a definite feeling that Rob anybody was going to find married life trickier than he thought. She was going to be sorry to leave them behind, but not terribly sorry. They were nice in a way, but they could, after a while, get on your nerves. Anyway, she was 11 now, and had a feeling that after a certain age, you shouldn't be sliding down holes in the ground to talk to little men. Besides, the look that Jeannie had given her just for a moment had been pure poison. Tiffany had read its meaning without even having to try. Tiffany had been the Kelder of the clan, even if it was only for a short time. She had also been engaged to be married to rob anybody, even if that had only been a sort of political trick. Jeannie knew all that, and the look had said, He is mine. This place is mine. I do not want you here. Keep out. A pool of silence followed Tiffany and Miss Tick down a lane, since the usual things that Russell and Hedges tended to keep very quiet when Anak MacFiegel were around. They reached the little village green and sat down to wait for the carrier's cart that went just a bit faster than walking pace and would take five hours to get to the village of Two Shirts, where, Tiffany's parents thought, they'd get the big coach that ran all the way to the distant mountains and beyond. Tiffany could actually see it coming up the road when she heard the hoofbeats across the green. She turned and her heart seemed to leap and sink all at the same time. It was Roland, the Baron's son, on a fine black horse. He leapt down before the horse had stopped and then stood there looking embarrassed. Ah, I see a very fine and interesting example of a, a big stone over there, said Miss Tick in a sticky sweet voice. I'll just go and have a look at it, shall I? Tiffany could have pinched her for that. Uh, you're going then, said Roland, as Miss Tick hurried away. Yes, said Tiffany. Roland looked as though he was going to explode with nervousness. I got this for you, he said. I made it, had it made by a man over in Yelp. He held out a package wrapped in soft paper. Tiffany took it and put it carefully in her pocket. Thank you she said, and dropped a small curtsy. Strictly speaking, that's what you had to do when you met a nobleman, but it just made Roland blush and stutter. Uh, uh, open it later on, said Roland. Um, I hope you like it. Thank you, said Tiffany sweetly. Here's the cut. Um, you don't want to miss it. Thank you, said Tiffany, and curtsied again because of the effect it had. It was a little bit cruel, but sometimes it had to be. Anyway, it would be very hard to miss the cart. If you ran fast, you could easily overtake it. It was so slow that stop never came as a surprise. There were no seats. The carrier went round the villages every other day, picking up packages and sometimes people. You just found a place where you could get comfortable among the boxes of fruit and rolls of cloth. Tiffany sat on the back of the cart, her old boots dangling over the edge, swaying backwards and forwards as the cart lurched away on a rough road. Miss Tick sat beside her, her black dress soon covered in chalk dust to the knees. Tiffany noticed that Roland didn't get back on his horse until the cart was nearly out of sight. And she knew Miss Tick. By now she would be just bursting to ask a question, because witches hate not knowing things. And sure enough, when the village was left behind, Miss Tick said, after a lot of shifting and clearing her throat, You gonna open it? Open what? said Tiffany, not looking at her. He gave you a present, said Miss Tick. I thought you were examining an interesting stone, Miss Tick, said Tiffany accusingly. Well, it was only fairly interesting, said Miss Tick, completely unembarrassed. So, are you going to open it? I'll wait till later, said Tiffany. She didn't want a discussion about Roland at this point, or really ever at all. She didn't actually dislike him. She'd found him in the land of the Queen of the Fairies and had sort of rescued him, although he'd been uncon unconscious most of the time. A sudden meeting with the Nakmak Fiegel when they're feeling edgy can do that to a person. Of course, without anyone actually lying, everyone at home had to come to believe that he had rescued her. A nine-year-old girl armed with a frying pan could, couldn't possibly have rescued a 13-year-old boy who had a sword. We know better. 
Tiffany hadn't minded that. It stopped people asking too many questions that she didn't want to answer or even know how to answer. But it taken to hanging around. She kept accidentally running into him on walks more often than was really possible. And he always seemed to be at the same village events that she went to. He was always polite, but she couldn't stand the way he kept looking like a spaniel that had been kicked. Admittedly, and it took some admitting, he was a lot less of a twit than he had been. On the other hand, there had been such a lot of twit to begin with. And then she thought, horse and wondered why until she realised that her eyes had been watching the landscape while her brain had stared at the past. "'I've never seen that before,' said Miss Tig. Tiffany welcomed it as an old friend. The chalk rose out of the plains quite suddenly on this side of the hills. There was a little valley cupped into the fall of the down and there was a carving in the curve it made. Turf had been cut away in long flowing lines so that the bare chalk made the shape of an animal. "'It's the white horse,' said Tiffany. "'Why do they call it that?' said Miss Tick. Tiffany looked at her. Because the chalk is white, she suggested, trying not to suggest that Miss Tick was being a little bit dense. No, I mean, why do they call it a horse? It doesn't look like a horse, it's just flowing lines that look as if they're moving, Tiffany thought. It had been cut out of the turf right back in the old days, people said, by the folk who'd built the stone circles and buried their kind in big earth mounds and they'd cut out the horse at one end of this little green valley ten times bigger than a real horse and, if you didn't look at it with your mind right, the wrong shape too. Yet, yeah, they must have known horses, owned horses, seen horses every day and they weren't stupid people just because they lived a long time ago. Tiffany had once asked her father about the look of the horse when they'd come all the way over here for a sheep fair and he told her what Granny Aching had told him when he was a little boy. He passed on what she said word for word and Tiffany did the same now. Taint what a horse looks like, said Tiffany. It's what a horse be. Oh, said Miss Tick. But because she was a teacher as well as a witch, she probably couldn't help herself, she added. The funny thing is, of course, that officially there is no such thing as a white horse. They're called grey. Yes, I know. This one's white, she added flatly. That quietened Miss Tick down for a while, but she seemed to have something on her mind. I expect you're upset about leaving the chalk, aren't you? She said as the cart rattled on. No, said Tiffany. It's okay to be. Thank you, but I'm not, really, said Tiffany. If you want to have a bit of a cry, you don't have to pretend you've got some grit in your hair or anything. I'm all right, actually, said Tiffany, honestly. You see, if you bottle that sort of a thing up, it can cause terrible damage later on. I'm not bottling anything, Miss Tick. In fact, Tiffany was a bit surprised at not crying, but she wasn't going to tell Miss Tick that. She left a sort of space in her head to burst into tears, but it wasn't filling up. Perhaps it was because she'd wrapped up all those feelings and doubts and left them up on the hill or by the pot-bellied stove. And if, of course, you were feeling a little bit downcast at the moment, I'm sure you could open the present he... Miss Tick tried. Tell me about Miss Level, Tiffany said quickly. The name and address was all she knew about the lady she was going to go and stay with, but an address like Miss Level, Cottage in the Woods near the Dead Oak Tree in Lost Man's Lane, High Overhang, if out, leave letters in the old boot by the door, sounded promising. Miss Level, yes, Miss said Miss Tick defeated. Uh, yes. She's not really very old, but she says she'll be happy to have a third pair of hands around the place. You couldn't slip words past Tiffany, not even if you were Miss Tick. So there's someone else there already? Um, no, not exactly. So she's got four arms, said Tiffany. Miss Tick had sounded like someone trying to avoid a subject. Miss Tick sighed. It was difficult to talk to someone who paid attention all the time. It kind of put you off. It's best if you wait until you meet her, she said. Anything I tell you will only give you the wrong idea. I'm sure you'll get along with her. She's very good with people and in her spare time she's a research witch. She keeps bees and goats, the milk of which I believe is very good indeed, owing to homogenised fats. What does, a, what does a research witch do? Tiffany asked. Oh, it's a very ancient craft. She tries to find new spells by learning how old ones were really done. You know all that stuff about ear of bat and toe of frog? They never work, but Miss Level thinks it's because we don't know exactly what kind of frog or which toe. 
I'm sorry, but I'm not going to help anyone chop up innocent frogs and bats, said Tiffany firmly. Oh no, she never kills any. She only uses creatures that have died naturally or been run over or commit suicide. Frogs can get quite depressed at times. The cart rolled on down a white dusty road until it was lost from view. Nothing happened. Skylarks sang so high up that they were invisible. Grass seeds filled the air. Sheep bowed high up on the chalk. And then something came along the road. It moved like a little slow whirlwind so it could only be seen by the dust that it stared up. As it went past, it made a noise like a swarm of flies. Then it too disappeared down the hill. After a while, a voice, low down in a long grass, said, Ah, oh, Crivens, and it's on a trail right enough. A second voice said, Surely the old hag will spot it. What? The teaching hag? She's near a proper hag. She's got the pointy hat under all them flowers, Big Jan, said the second voice a bit reproachfully. I seen it. She presses a wee spring and the point comes up. Oh, aye, Hamish, and I dare say she does the reading and the writing well enough, but she does not ken about stuff that's not in books, and I'm not showing myself while she's around. She's the kind of body that I'd write things down about a man. Come on, let's go and find the Kelder. So I wonder, because we saw that whirlwind thing right at the start when I started reading this story. We saw the whirlwind, didn't we, that sounded like a swarm of flies. And it was looking for something because it went past all of the sheep, but it wasn't happy with their brains. And then I think it got drawn. I can't remember the exact words, but it got drawn towards Tiffany. And now here she is going down the hill in that cart. And it is also following her. So whatever it is, something magical, I'm guessing is after Tiffany and the Feagles know what it is. So when they said, let's go and tell the Kelder, or go and help the Kelder what they just said, are they going to go and tell Jeannie, the new Kelder, or are they going to go and tell Tiffany, their old Kelder? <gasps> so many questions. I'm sure we'll find out tomorrow. Okay, night-night, sleep tight. Bye-bye.